How's everybody doing? We are thrilled that you're here with us at 12:15. So, let me tell you about the very first sermon I ever gave, which was an absolute disaster. Uh, it, 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 so, the way it worked is when I started, when I was doing my undergrad in theology, I uh, Tuesday night was kind of the big night at. Um, at colleges, can we did like a chapel, a small chapel service before all the classes dispersed and then went to their individual room. So, and one of the students would give the message and it was a short 10 minute message, but the, the student would give the message. And so about four or five weeks in, it was my turn to, to, to teach. It was my, my first time. So, and they just said, look, doesn't have to be a big thing. 10 minutes, pick a text, talk about it. You know, not a big deal. So I spent a month preparing for this message. I, I knew what I was going to teach on. I was going to teach on Psalm 37, verse 4, this wonderful verse that says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So what I was going to do is I was going to pray. I was going to read that passage. I was going to explain the passage. I was going to tell a story that related to my life about the passage. I was going to give some application to the students in our walk with God. And then I was going to pray again at the end, and then that was going to be it. I'm mean, like, that, that's going to take 10 minutes. So I, and I had like three or four pages of notes. I, I thought about calling out the day of, but I was a Christian, so I couldn't lie. And, uh, but I, I did try to get into a car accident and like a fender bender. So I'm like, hey, can't do it. Sorry. Catch me next semester. Anyway, so, but I didn't. So I got there and uh, I got up there and I prayed and I read the passage and I explained the passage. I told the story. And I'm, you know, I'm flipping through pages of notes. And then I gave an application for our students. And then I prayed again. And then I sat down. And then I looked. And there were still six minutes left on the clock. And I'm like, wow. I said everything. I, I've been praying for a month. And, uh, and, and it was so weird because no one knew what to do. And so our professor just stood up and started teaching and just ignored what had happened. And uh, it wasn't until the end of class that he walked up to me, and the only thing that he said was he put his hand on my shoulder, and he says, well, Bob, the good news is it can only get better. And uh, that, was, that was that. That was my start into my, my preaching career. And uh, thankfully, things did get better, but what would happen is, is that, and then, you know, so it wasn't the content that, would, that I would struggle with. I would struggle so badly with distractions because someone would get up in the middle of the service. You know, I understand sometimes people need to get up for something, but I, they, I, someone would get up in the middle of the service and leave, and I'd be like, what did I say? <laughs> and then they would come back a minute later. I'm like, oh, I'm so grateful they forgave me. And, uh, and I'm sorry, I was like living with this torture every time someone stood up. And so now, listen, then I had three kids. And listen, a bomb could go off in here. I'm still going to finish. Like, nothing's going to distract me. And, but I'll tell you this. I, now, we try to keep distractions to a minimum, because, not because of what it does for me, because I see what it does to you. And because all of you guys are looking this way, I'm the only one looking this way, and I see what happens. Someone stands up and walks out, and you guys, immediate, first thing you do is forget about anything I'm saying, and you're like, hey, what's going on with them? Where are they headed? Do they have to go to the bathroom? Do I have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Are there snacks where they're going? And it's like, it's like and I'm gone. I'm totally gone. And, and so that's why, anyway, uh, I, I will say this. Uh, you know, we, we started our church almost 23 years ago. And uh, my favorite, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. We'll have a big party in September. Uh, but uh, my, my, my favorite distraction story, I, I hated it when it happened, but my favorite story happened, we were about two and a half years old as a church, and some of you know this, that when we started our church, uh, the second place that we met was in a movie theater. And so we were in the movie theater, and you know, there's all kinds of different movies that are playing there all the time. And so we, uh, we, were, we met in the big, the big movie, the, the big theater uh, in, in Miami Lakes, and so in, in that, the, the one that sat the, mo the, that mo the most people. And so anyway... So I'm probably about 15 minutes into my message, and the um, as and you remember, and it's a movie theater, so people come in from both sides, kind of towards the middle, and so I would, um, so I kind of see people as I'm coming in, or they're walking out, or whatever. But I see this woman come in, and she's very nicely dressed, and the 
um, the usher hands her a program. And then she takes it, she asks the usher a question, and then she comes and sits down right, uh, right pretty close to where she, was, uh, where she was standing in that same row. So she sits down, and then she starts looking at the program. And you know, uh, listen, and I'll just tell you, I'm looking at, when I'm, when I'm teaching, I'm looking around. I'm looking at all of you guys. I see what you're doing. I see who's asleep. I know who's been naughty or nice. You know, anyway. And I know how it is. You guys all sit in the same spot. It's, what's weird is when some of you come to a different service and then you try to sit in the same spot and what you don't realize is that's someone's spot at a different service. I don't tell you that because I don't want to upset you. But that's somebody else's spot. And then there's like a moment. We're like, oh, so you're sitting here? Is that what, that's what we're doing? Anyway, so I'm like, hey, man, we love each other. Let brotherly love continue. Anyway, that's what the Bible says. So anyway, so the woman is, um, she's looking at the program and she's looking at me and she's looking at the, and she's just doing this for like 10 minutes. She just keeps looking at the program and looking at me and then she's listening. She's just like, and, and she's just, anyway, after about 10 minutes of this, she stands up in the middle of the service and says, this isn't Harry Potter. And then she walks out. And, and I, I have so many questions. Like, here's the fr- f- question number one. When did you realize that I wasn't Dumbledore? <laughs> like, at what point was she like, is he a wizard? Is he not a wizard? You know, I just, anyway, I just, I, so many questions. Now, the reason I tell you this is because uh, we started this last week, and this week we're, we're looking at the very first sermon that was ever given in the Christian church at the day of Pentecost when the church was born. And so we're in this series, as you saw in the opening, that's called The Movement because we, we went through a series in the Gospel of Matthew called The Story, but the story didn't end at the resurrection. That's where the story began because the story became a movement of how these disciples took the gospel from Jerusalem and it impacted the entire world. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we go through the book of Acts. And if you were with us last week, we talked about how the Holy Spirit fell on these believers. And when the Holy Spirit fell on the believers, they began speaking in different languages. And um, as the Spirit was giving them opportunity to, and, and the people that were there could hear them and understood what they were saying. And it created this, um, this question, like, what does all this mean? Peter stands up. And he starts to explain what it meant, that it was actually the fulfillment of a prophecy that was given in the book of Joel, that in the last days, God was going to pour out his spirit on all people, that they were going to speak with new languages, that young men were going to see visions, old men were going to dream dreams, and that then he gets to the end, and this is the last uh, verse that we read last week, you see it on the screen, it says, and it shall come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this becomes... Peter's transition point to where he goes from explaining what it meant, that is, th- this is, this explanation is what happened in the, pro- in, in the book of Joel, to now we're going to talk about calling on the name of the Lord, and we're going to talk about the name, Jesus, and how all people can be saved through him. And so Peter's going to talk to us, and he's going to talk to these, as he talks to these believers, we're going to be listening in and learning what it means to be a Christian, how we can know if we are one, and how to grow in our faith to maturity. And so we're going to start In Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 22, which is where we left off. And here's what we read. Peter of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, and this is a quote from Psalm 16, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption, for you have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. So if you pause there and give me your attention, if I want to be someone who grows to maturity, if we want to be someone who grows to maturity, what, what do we have to understand? The first thing, if you're a note taker, is this, and that is I have to understand who Jesus is who he is. 
If I want to have a mature faith, I need to know who Jesus is experientially. That is, I've experienced the love and grace of God. But I also need to know some things educationally, historically. That is, know some things about him. And you know why that is? Is because that's how all relationships work. If you have a great marriage, you know what I I can be sure of? Is that you know tons about your spouse. You know things experientially about your spouse. That is, you've been doing life together what they like, what they don't like, what they love, what they don't love. But you also know things historically, educationally, things about their background, things about how they came to be who they are. So, and let me explain it this way. So last night, uh, we've been taking our kids through the Indiana Jones movies because I'm a good parent. And so uh, uh, last night, we watched uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which is probably one of my 20 favorite movies of all time. And so, thank you. And... uh, now, but uh, if, you, if you've seen the movie, the, towards the end of the movie, they, are, they get to what they call Alexandretta, which is really the city of Petra in Jordan. And there's the facade of this ancient temple there. And I was telling the kids, I'm like, hey, your mom and I have been there. And they're like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, that's actually uh, in the city of Jordan. And we went there. Uh, we spent two days in, uh, in Jordan when we went to Israel years ago. And so after the movie... I go into the garage and I pull out this box and within five minutes I had located a 24-year-old picture of us. And and this is it, by the way. Um, I know it's hard to see. It's kind of blown up. But yeah, so young and sexy. And uh, (laughs) Carrie looks good too. Anyway, so... (laughs) So, but this is uh, right right at the the base of the temple. And um, what's funny is, is that, and I may have shared this before, but right here where we were standing, there's these kind of, they cut into the stone are these channels. And then at the base of it, there's almost like a, uh, like a basin. It's it's like, it's in the stone is this, um, it's almost like uh, they've kind of carved this out. So it's, it's, it's this, uh, this kind of deep bowl. And, uh, and I asked our tour guide, like, hey, what, what is this? And he's like, oh, well, you know, um, the ancient Nabataeans, uh, that's where they would, do, they would do human sacrifices here and this would catch all the blood. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad we took a romantic picture here. So anyway, love you to death. And uh, so anyway, uh, but I, so we start there and I just, I pull out hundreds of pictures. And I pull out, I start pulling out, not just pictures of our family, I start pulling out pictures that my kids haven't really seen uh, of my wife from every stage of her life. And it's like, hey, this was your mom in the third grade. And this is her fourth grade picture. And this is her sixth grade picture when she was in orchestra playing the cello. And then this is when your mom and I met. And this is the ID that your mom had when she was in work study in high school. This is how she got off the campus to go, go to her job. And, uh, and, and, so, and I'm going through all this. And I, and I have every letter and every postcard that we wrote to each other when uh, she was away at college. And, um, and so, and at one point my wife just says, how in the world do you have all this stuff? And I said, because it involves you. And if it involves you, I'm interested. I know, right? I, sometimes I'm just like, wow, he is so fantastic. And I'm speaking of myself. I really am quite something. And, uh, and so, <laughs> uh, you're a piece of work. And uh, so, now, but I'll tell you the picture that everyone loved most was, there's this picture from, I think, 2009 or so um, of my wife and I at Chef Mickey's. Uh, at, at Disney World. And for whatever, I don't understand why, because I don't understand certain things, but I am wearing this dark green track suit. And then it's like black on top. It looks like, remember the old uniforms from like Star Trek, the next generation? So it's like, it's one color on top. So it's like black on top and then this like dark green. And I, and, and I look like a member of the mafia. And I'm like, what in the world was I thinking? Well, um, I, I'm putting all the pictures away. And my wife is like, no, 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 leave that one out. We're putting that one up. And I'm like, please, come on. I look like an idiot in this picture. And she's like, no, 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 we'll leave it. Well, anyway, my daughter Olivia is, because th- you know, if you go to Chef Mickey, they do the pictures, they put it in this little folder. And so as she's putting it away, this little envelope comes out from behind the sorry, comes out from behind the picture. And apparently in whatever insane state I was in, I bought the family pack. So it wasn't just the picture. There's like seven other pictures that were smaller rolled out. And then my daughter starts handing out pictures to everyone in my family. 
by the time I went to sleep, everyone in my family had that picture hanging on their wall in their room. And then people wonder, like, why does Pastor Bob have low self-esteem? This is why. And so, anyway, and I didn't bring that picture. Fine, I brought it. It's here. And, like, what in the world? What is happening here? And then, like, what's going on with this chain? Like, you know, anyway, I, 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 I anyway, I don't know. I, there are so many problems. Oh, okay, I guess we're done with that. And um, so, oh, it's, what, are you guys messing with me now? <laughs> this is exactly what happened at home. Sheesh, sorry. Oh, now it's gone. Have we moved on? No, we're not moving. <laughs> that's my daughter Olivia laughing. Uh, <laughs> So, okay, I'm, that's it. I'm done. I'm moving on. I wanted to say something, but now I'm done. It's over. If it shows up, don't even tell me. It's done. <laughs> this is the weirdest service. This is hands down the weirdest service we'd ever had. <laughs> if a wizard shows up, that's like Calvary bingo and somebody's won. So anyway, but here's the, th <laughs> here's the thing that happens is that the more that you love, the more that you love someone, the more you want to know about them. And then what happens is the more you know about them, the more you love them. And there's this wonderful cyclical thing that happens that the more you know, it deepens your love. The deeper your love is, the more that you want to know. And this is not just what happens in any, any human relationship. It's what happens in our relationship with God. We get to know Jesus more and, and it just, it deepens our love for him. And the more that we love him, the more that we want to know him. And this is the point that, that's, that's happening. And, and so when we talk about knowing Jesus, not just exponentially, but knowing Jesus even historically, educationally, um, it's going to cause you to trust him more. Listen, the New Testament storyline, that is the things that we, kind of the very basic things that we know about Jesus are confirmed by outside sources. I mean, I'm saying outside of the New Testament and outside of Christian sources. So there are, so if you look at historians like Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Thallus, Flagon of Thallus, which by the way, if you're thinking of naming your children, these are all good. Oh, this is my son, Suetonius. Flagon will be all along in a little bit. But these guys, these guys were all not Christians, but they were writers um, towards the end of the first century. And they were, they were writing about what was happening in the world. These were historians. And so, and this is the thing, you can confirm the New Testament storyline without ever even looking at the New Testament. Now, the New Testament is going to give you more detail and all that. So let me give you an example. Let me give you a few facts. Here's number one. We'll go through a dozen of these. Jesus lived in the time of Tiberius Caesar. There were people that had said, oh, the, the myth of Jesus developed over the course of time. No, non-Christian historians established the fact in the first century that Jesus lived at the time of Tiberius Caesar. Number two. Jesus lived a virtuous life. That was established. That's not just something that the New Testament teaches. Number three, Jesus was a worker of wonders. This is one of the things that people will say is, oh, the legend of Jesus developed. Maybe he was a teacher, but the, the fact that he did miracles, that developed over the course of centuries. No, first century non-Christian historians all agree that Jesus was a worker of miracles. Number four, that Jesus had a brother named James. They're making the familial connection. Number five, Jesus was acclaimed to be the Messiah. And that's one of the things that people will say is, oh, well, they didn't actually believe that Jesus was the Messiah. That just, no, this was established very early on. Even people who weren't Christians knew that the, that, that the, young, the early believers understood that Jesus was the Messiah. Number six, Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. You know that this, there was a thing that happened in the early 20th century where people believed that Pontius Pilate was non-existent, that, that he was a made-up figure. Until there was some remodeling that took place in Caesarea, and they, there was these stairs, and when they remodeled the stairs, they were all these giant stones. If you come with us to Israel, that's one of the first places we're going to go is Caesarea uh, Maritime. Anyway, but they go up the stairs, they remodel this, they find the, this giant stone with the inscription of Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea, the whole thing. Anyway, it's in the Israeli Museum now, and we'll see that when we, when we go there. But 
Um, and then all the other evidence starts, starts coming out. But once again, early non-Christian sources understood and agreed that Pontius Pilate was the prefect of Judea and that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Number seven, an earthquake, an eclipse and an earthquake. Now, Matthew 27 tells us this. Non-Christian sources also tell us this. Number eight, Jesus was crucified on the eve of the Passover. The New Testament tells us this, but even non-Christian sources are telling us this as well. Number nine, Jesus' disciples believed that he rose from the dead. This is another thing that people say, oh, the idea of the resurrection developed over time. No, it was believed immediately and the believers were willing to go to their death because of it, which is what we see next. Number 10, the believers were willing to die for their beliefs. You know, not one of them recanted. Not one of them ever tried to modify what was, well, what I really meant was, no, all of them said, he rose, I saw it, and kill me if you want to, but I'm not going to recant. Number 11, Christianity spread rapidly as far as Rome. That's another thing people have said, oh, you know, Christianity was this, this small sect. No, 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 it was, it was uh, spreading rapidly in the Roman Empire, which is eventually what brought the persecution. And then number 12 is that Jesus' disciple denied the Roman gods and worshipped Jesus as God. The divinity of Jesus is not something that developed uh, at the Council of Nicaea in 300. It was something that was understood immediately at, because the disciples recognized it. So when Peter preaches this sermon, and he says, he opens the sermon by saying, men of Judea, Jesus was attested to you or presented to you by God and did miracles which you yourselves know. Then he starts talking about the arrest crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and he backs it up using a passage of scripture in Psalm 16, which is the passage we read. Now, remember, and this is an important thing to note, most Jews, not all, but most Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead at the end of time, that there would be a moment, no one knew when it was, that there would be a resurrection when all godly people all at once would be resurrected. The idea of one person being resurrected while a biblical idea that we see in places like Psalm 16 and others was not something that they had gotten their head around uh, yet. Now, truth be told, and, and, and this is an important thing, sometimes when we look at Bible prophecy, it's hard to figure out how this is going to happen. And sometimes it's only after it happens that we realize, oh, now it makes sense. And by the way, most of the time, most of the mistakes that people make about Bible prophecy, it's not because they're taking it too literally, it's because they're not taking it literally enough. I'll give you an example of, of one, this is one of my favorite ones, is uh, of ones that's like, how in the world is this gonna work out? There's a prophecy in, uh, about a king whose name is Zedekiah. Zedekiah was a horrible king of Judah, and he was the king at the time of the Babylonian captivity around uh, 586 BC when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was wiped out. Jeremiah... Uh, who was a prophet, around Jeremiah 39, he makes this prophecy, and he, he says to kings, about King Zedekiah, you are going into captivity into Babylon. And then Ezekiel, who, by the way, is a contemporary, they're, they're, they're prophesying around the same time to the same people. Around Ezekiel chapter 12, Ezekiel makes a prophecy, and he says, yeah, you're going into captivity, but you're not going to see Babylon. Now, there's a problem. Are you going to Babylon or are you not going to Babylon? And this created an issue where it's like, well, which, who's right? They're both prophets of God. They're both revered among the people as far as the, that their, their prophecies were true. How, how does it work? What's the problem? God is being so specific and sometimes we miss it because we're not being literal enough. Let me read to you what happens in 2 Kings chapter 25. It says, so they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. And they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. He went to Babylon, but never saw it. And listen, who was right? They were both right. They, Jeremiah says, you're going. Ezekiel says, you're going, but you're not going to see it. Here's my point. There are things that God is doing in your life that make absolutely no human sense right now, especially if you're in the middle of it. And you're like, God is, uh, is, has God lost the plot as to what's going on here? No, let me tell you something. God is working at a level sometimes that we can't even understand. And by God solving your problem, he's actually doing something in somebody else's life at the same time. And this is a conversation that my, my wife and I have all the time. 
and, and this is one of the things that I'll say at home all the time, that God's work is like a six-lane highway. And that is that God is never doing just one thing. God is a multitasker. God is always doing one, he might be doing one thing in your life, but it's ne- it never stops there. It's one thing in your life, it's next thing in somebody else's life, that's ricocheting off somebody else, and there's a multitude of things that are happening all at the same time. And sometimes if we just look at our thing, we're like, I don't know how it works out, but here's what you'll find. The more you know Jesus, the more you trust him. The more you trust him, the more you love him. And the more you love him, you're gonna see the work that he's doing in you, but also all around you and the more mature you're going to be. And that's what, look what happens in verse 29. He says this, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself, uh, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, if we want to be mature, we said, I got to understand who Jesus is. But the second thing is, I need to understand what Jesus wants. That's why Dave, uh, Peter begins by explaining the Psalm 16 passage. That David, being a prophet, knows, knowing that God had promised that the Messiah would come through his family, speaks about the resurrection. And he says, you're all witnesses of his resurrection. Remember, we are less than two months from the resurrection. And Peter's saying, you, he rose and you heard about it. Some of you witnessed it because you're still here in Jerusalem. You've been here since the feast. And then he says that Jesus said that he was going to pour out his spirit on all of us. And that's what you're hearing now. Peter is bringing them into the conversation they had with Jesus in chapter 1 about the promise of the Spirit, and he's giving context to what happened earlier in chapter 2. And then Peter does, this is my favorite part of this whole sermon, is that Peter takes a page out of Jesus' playbook and quotes Psalm 110. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22, the, all these different uh, sects of Jewish life come to him. Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, all these different groups. They come to Jesus asking him questions to try to stump him, to try to get him to say something that they can use against him. And he just answers so incredibly that they keep, they kind of walk away scratching their heads. And then Jesus says, hey, I want to ask you a question. And so he quotes this very Psalm, Psalm 110. We'll let Jesus here ask it. So this is uh, Matthew 22. This is Jesus speaking. It says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, so how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying the Lord, that is God, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And this is the thing. And you know, the the next verse says, nobody asked him any more questions. Everybody's like, Jesus' Bible kung fu is better than anybody else's kung fu. We got to leave. We got to get out of here. And this is, and listen, so that's why Peter ends the sermon with that very thing. Because he's saying that Jesus is even greater than King David because David is calling the Messiah Lord. And this is an important point here that I don't want us to miss. That you and I become like the people that we hang around with. And I mentioned this in our very first message, and I said that we would try to slow down enough to, 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 to note this. Every time the disciples do something that they saw Jesus do, we're going to try to note that. And this is the first time that we note it, is that Jesus stumps people, kind of ends the conversation, and that's how Peter's going to end his sermon. And this is the moment. And this is, this is so powerful. This, and this is the point that, that I think is important for us that we make. The people that you invite into your inner circle should be people that you want to be more like. 
the people who are where you want to be in life. Because the saying is true that we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. Uh, I grew up in Boston. Some of you know that. But I, 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 I lived in Boston until I was about 14. And every time we go visit my family in, in Boston, by the end of our trip, my wife starts dropping her R's. And she's parking the car. Praise the Lord. Sins are wicked bad. Bel don't believe me? Ask your mother. And so, anyway... Uh, and, and, so, and, and, it's, and it's so hilarious, and, it's just, and it is the power of influence. And, and, people, and, and people ask me this all the time, like, how is it that you are from Boston and you don't have the typical Bostonian accent? And I'll just say, well, because God healed me. And so, <laughs> now, <laughs> but here's, listen, you don't go to Boston and change the way they speak. Instead, what happens is, after a while, they start influencing how you speak. And once again, this is the danger of letting certain people speak into your life. And by the way, I'm not talking about becoming a hermit and cutting yourself off from all relationships with anybody who's not a Christian or, or, or whatnot. No, it's not a great strategy if you want to reach people. We have to build relationships with people who don't know Jesus. That's part of the great commission that Jesus commanded us. And, and by the way, and I'm glad, whoever it was that reached us and presented the gospel to us, I'm so glad that they didn't adopt that hermit philosophy. I'm just going to cut off anybody who's not a believer. No, we'd be in, we'd be in trouble. But in, what I'm saying is, is that we just need to be wise in our friendships and knowing who are the people that we receive counsel from and who are the people that we allow to speak into our lives. There's a reason why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, don't be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. We want to minister to people and help them draw closer to Jesus, but we need to know the difference between friends that are speaking into our lives and people that we're helping. And if we don't get that right, we will find ourselves in bad situations. Now, I love this part. So what happens? Peter preaches this amazing sermon, what takes place. Look what happens in verse 37. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to him, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. If you pause there and, uh, and give me your attention, last thing I want to tell you, if I you say, I need to know who Jesus is, I need to know what Jesus wants, and the last part in your notes is, I need to understand how Jesus works. One of the things that happens, uh, especially in my life, I came to know Jesus just out of high school. And so because of that, I, didn't, I wasn't really settled, and I've shared this in the past, I wasn't really settled on a lot of issues, but I had to learn basically everything that it meant to walk with God. And it's kind of like, if you're a parent, you realize that. When my son was, uh, he's almost 14 now, but when he was about three years old, I remember one night he climbs up on my lap after dinner and asks if he can have a sip of my Coke Zero. And I said, sure. And it was almost full. You know, you don't need to be a prophet to know what happened next. Is that he just like half the, half the can just is all over him. And I'm like, what happened? He's like, dad, I don't know. I went to take a sip and it went everywhere. And for whatever reason, I said, I want you to show me how you take a sip. And that just explained everything. And he was essentially aiming the soda in the direction of his mouth, where he's like, and trying to like shoot out the liquid somewhere that it would hit the target. And I'm like, no, that's, you got to touch the can with your lips. And he's like, okay. And so then he's trying to do this thing that I end up calling the seagull, which I can't even do it with my mouth, but he's like, he's trying to like, he's trying to do this thing where he, he kind of like pours the liquid into the bottom of his mouth. And I'm like, dude, you're not a bird. This does not work. And so uh, you can't leave. There, ha there can be no gap. You have to create some type of suction so that the, there is a liquid transfer from the can. And yes, I talk to my kids like this at three years old. So from the can into you. So then um, he's like, okay. So then, he, I mean, you got to kind of perch your lips a little bit. So he kind of perches his lips you know, as a little guy. And then um, he goes to take a sip and it's like all over the side of his face. And I'm like, how did this happen? And then he shows me and I'm like, dude, the opening was on the side. I'm like, how do I even have to have this conversation? I'm like, dude, you have to line up the opening of the can with the opening of your face. 
That's how this works. And then, and then I had to tell his mom, like, I'm sorry, our son has a drinking problem. <laughs> and, uh, and so, anyway, thank, I, am, I am happy to report to you that he is fully trained, and if you get him a, a Coke, he'll drink it. And so, but there were things that you expected to, to teach your kids, right? You expected to teach them how to ride a bike or tie their shoes or um, to tie a tie, but you never thought you'd have to drink, teach them how to, how to drink out of a can, right? Just that, it was just like, that was like, you thought that was baked in the DNA. It's not. And so... But listen, I, I was like that. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And um, I, I, I came to the Bible knowing nothing. And so I didn't know any characters um, from the Bible outside of movies I had seen in the years that I went to parochial school. And, but once again, everything that I learned about who Jesus is and what Jesus wants um, for my life and what it meant to walk with God, I learned as I started walking with God. And because I was 19 years old, I just made this decision. I'm like, you know, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm just going to do whatever it says to do. And, and I'm telling you, and I remember going to church, and I was reading about baptism. And then I went to church, and the pastor was talking about baptism. And I'm like, I think i got to do that. And I remember signing up and then talking to somebody and saying, you know what? I, I, was, um, I was baptized when I was an infant, and I don't know if that creates a problem. And, you know, like if the baptism police, you know, if they're going to be notified. And... Um, I was assured the baptism police was okay with it. And, uh, but but they, they, and, and they, you know, they, they just gave, they gave me such good counsel. And they said, listen, um, your baptism as an infant spoke so much about your parents' faith. You make a decision to follow Jesus, and now your baptism as an adult speaks about your faith and your desire to walk with God. And I'm telling you, it just cleared all the confusion for me. And, uh, and, and while it may have been so basic, it was a revelation for me um, as, as, a, as a young believer. So Peter, when they're like, hey, what do we do? And Peter tells these guys, you need to repent and everyone needs to be baptized. Now, let me explain something because um, I got this question. Uh, there was a woman in the church that asked me this question a couple weeks ago in the lobby. And I said, hey, when I get to chapter two, I promise I'll talk about it. And um, at the end of the gospel of Matthew, and this was, her, this was her question, at the end of the gospel of Matthew, it says that we should be, that Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Whereas here, Peter says, let all of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And so her thing was, you know, I'd, been, I'd gone to this church and they had taught that you should be baptized in the name of Jesus only versus Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so I gave her kind of a basic explanation, but I said, I'll give you a little more explanation when, we get, when I get to this passage. Now, by the way, the, um, just so you know this, this idea of being baptized in the name of Jesus only uh, comes from a sermon that was preached in one sermon that was preached in 1913 by this Pentecostal preacher and has really only been embraced by ultra Pentecostal circles. Um, most other denominations, there is no Bible college or seminary that, that holds to that position. Um, but now the explanation is this, and it's simple. And it's not in, they're, they're not in opposition to each other, which, is the, which I think is the, the, the point. Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Many of these cultures had no concept of the God of Israel. So while they were being introduced to the Father and the Spirit at the same time that they were being taught about the Son, Jesus. So there are three cases, in the, and it's only in the book of Acts, where we see that people are baptized into the name of Jesus. In every case, they were Jews. Peter, in this sermon, references over and over Men of Israel, men and brothers, our father David, these are all Jews that were in Jerusalem for the feast, over and over. These Jews, were all, they already knew the Father. They, they already knew who the Holy Spirit was because the Holy Spirit is, re is revealed in, in, in the Old Testament. But what was happening? They were believing that Jesus was the Messiah. And the reason why, the, why Luke is making this, this very specific thing is because Jews had their own right of baptism. If you were, not Jew, uh, you were born some other faith and you were coming to know the God of Israel, you would be baptized. If you were, uh, even in circumcision, there's a cleansing that takes place even if you're born in a Jewish home. So there is a type of baptism or cleansing that takes place regardless. And so the specificity of what's being said here is these were Jews that were believing that Jesus was the Messiah. So, just to explain what we do at Calvary, when you see us do baptisms, we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because it's what Jesus taught. But 
if a Jewish person is just coming to know Jesus and they say, I want to be baptized in the name of Jesus, there's, I think it's perfectly appropriate to baptize them in the name of Jesus if they want to because they're already familiar with the Father and the Spirit. And so then Peter says, uh, not just repent and be baptized, but be saved from this perverse generation. And the, that word perverse is this Greek word, scolios, where we get the English medical term scoliosis. And it, 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 the idea is, is that it's not just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a Jewish idiom that the way of the wicked is crooked, the way of the Lord is always straight. And then we're told, and this is a powerful statement, that 3,000 people are saved after the preaching of this sermon. And this is very significant. Why? If you were with us last week, we talked about how the Jews celebrated the Feast of Pentecost. Remember, this is, this is the day of Pentecost. This is all happening. And so all of this that's, that's happening, um, Pentecost is called the birthday of Judaism because it's the day that God gave the law to the people of Israel. Now, what happened? God spoke the law from Mount Sinai, but then Moses came down with two tablets of stone. And if you know the story, you know what happens. Moses comes down with two tablets of stone, and what are the people doing? They're worshiping a golden calf. And so he destroys, he breaks the tablets of stone because the people were already breaking the commandments. And in the book, of there's, there's this kind of um, insurrection that rises up there in, in, in Exodus 32. And then look what happens it says this in your notes, and you see it up on the screen, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. 3,000 people died. And on the, di- on, on the first Pentecost, here's what happens. 3,000 people are saved on, on, this Pente- on this Pentecost. Why? Because when they realized God was birthing something when 3,000 died, now 3,000 are saved. Oh, God is birthing something new. Something powerful is, is happening here. And listen, can I, can I share this with you that I think is so important? And that maybe you're hearing this and you're saying, yes, that's, that's me. That's me. I, 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 I'm the one who needs to, I need to experience this. I need to experience God's forgiveness and grace. Listen, it was 30 years ago um, that I gave my life to Jesus. And, and, and let me tell you something. Um, in my life was a mess. I was as lost as anybody could be. But you know, I heard that Jesus loved me and wanted to forgive me. And I'm telling you, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. And by the way, I had heard the gospel before. But this time that I heard the gospel, my wife was sitting next to me and we had just been dating for just a couple of months. And, and, and she heard the gospel and she said to me, she said, I'm doing this. And it was the best peer pressure I've ever experienced in my life because I looked at her when she said, I'm doing this. And I said, I said that I'm doing this too. And my life has never been the same. Why? Because... Every person wants to experience forgiveness because every person wants to experience leaving the past in the past and letting go of all of that so that we can walk boldly into the future. Because listen, if I could have cleaned my mess up on my own, I would have done it by then, but I couldn't. And so listen, maybe for some of us, like it was for them in that moment, how it was their moment, maybe this is our moment where we say, yeah, I want a relationship with my heavenly father. And that comes through the person of Jesus, that we want to experience forgiveness, a change in our lives where our past really becomes the past. And that maybe this is the moment that we leave different than we came in. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you so much for this promise that you give to us, the work that you want to do in and through us. And Lord, I want to pray for every person that feels like this is the moment for them to be forgiven, transformed, changed by you. Lord, let this be the day that they experience everything that you have for them. Listen, with every head bowed and every eye closed as we're praying together, maybe you're saying this is, yeah, I need God to do this in my life. I need to experience the forgiveness of Jesus, the work of Jesus. I need that. I need to come to know Jesus in a real way. And listen, if that's you, I want to pray for you as we close. And so listen, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you say, Pastor, that's me, I'm just going to invite you to lift your hand right now, and I'm going to pray for you as we close. Yeah, see a lot of hands. God bless you guys. 
Yeah, God bless you guys. Lord, I thank you for every hand that's lifted that represents hearts that are open, that are ready for you to do a great work in and through them. Lord, that this could be the moment that changes everything because you love us so much. Listen, those of you that have lifted a hand, I, I want to invite you to repeat this prayer with me. It's not a magic formula. They might be my words, but I pray that they would express your heart to God in these moments. And here's what we know, is that if we will pray in sincerity, God will hear us, answer, and act, and we'll leave this place different than we came in. So I'm going to invite you to pray out loud. We're all going to pray out loud together and say, Dear God, I come to you today, and I'm sorry for all my sins, but I thank you for Jesus who died for me that I might have life. I want to walk with you starting right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus and begin a relationship with Him, congratulations. It's the best decision you're ever going to make. You may be wondering, so what happens now? Where do I go from here? Just text BEGIN to 62488 and we'll be able to send you this free gift. It's a book called BEGIN written by Pastor Bob and it's going to help you take those first steps on your new journey of faith. So remember, to stay up to date with everything happening at Calvary, follow at my Calvary on Instagram and Facebook. Until next week, we love you, we're praying for you, God bless you.